Hey, good morning. Hope you're doing well. I uh, wanted to build off of last week's message a little, a little bit. Last week we talked about where to, where to from here uh, and talked about vision for navigating now. And we talked about returning to our first love was key for, um, for right now. We talked about a political spirit, uh, the dangers of a political spirit and a religious spirit, how it stifles life. It sucks the life out of out of us, but to revival, the, the life of the Holy Spirit, the breath of the Holy Spirit gives life, and that the way forward that God gives us is a way of humility and repentance, even repentance of uh, letting a political spirit drive us instead of the Holy Spirit drive us, and to stand in, in the culture with a heart that's free from bitterness and that's returned to our first love and that's doing the things that we did at first. And today I want to talk uh, about vision for navigating now. Um, part two, uh, talking about kind of, of a couple of tools that we need um, right now uh, as as the body of Christ, as God's church, as believers in Jesus. He's given us some tools to navigate life in the kingdom of God, um, in this world, and to flourish. And even flourish in times when culture doesn't seem to agree with, with us uh, as believers in, in the Lord. If the culture is if we're in kind of contrast with the culture, how do we navigate that? And how do we stand in the gates of our culture with a voice that influences, and that has influence and uh, that is credible and respected? And God wants his church to be a voice, to stand in the gates of culture uh, and to stand for truth and to stand uh, as a witness for him. He called us to be salt and he called us to be light in the world. He said that we're the light of the world. He said he's the light of the world, but that we, his church, are the light of the world because his spirit lives inside of us, that that's our task, that's our mission, to love God, to love people, to make disciples of all nations, to be the light of the world. Um, and in that mission, um, how we navigate that mission, how we live out that mission really matters. It doesn't matter just that we try to make the mission happen or that we stand for truth in the culture. It matters how we do it. And so I want to look at Daniel because Daniel kind of lived at a time where um, his people, uh, Babylonians, had conquered Jerusalem, um, had torn down the walls, had burned people's homes, had burned the temple to the ground and taken people off into exile. And Daniel was a young man who was part of those that were taken off into exile. So if anyone had a reason for bitterness, if anyone had a reason to um, be driven by a political spirit, to want to rebel, to want to um, you know, live, live life on his terms, he, he, had a, he had a reason. He had seen his family uprooted, his life uprooted, his, his city burned to the ground, his temple, his faith had been attacked and the temple desecrated and burned to the ground. And so Daniel had every reason, his faith being attacked, his family being attacked, his culture attacked, his city attacked. He had every reason for bitterness to, to take root in his heart and to live that out in his life, but he didn't. And because he didn't let that happen, and because Daniel was never really driven, even though he lived in the political realm, you can tell in his life he never was driven by a political spirit. And because of that, um, he had influence. And so I just want to talk about that for a minute. Um, as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of, of Babylon, had, had they conquered the, um, Jerusalem, had taken people off into exile, uh, Daniel is in his co um, kind of one of the wise men uh, in, in, um, in the king's court. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in Daniel chapter 2. It kind of tells the whole story. He has this kind of troubled night, and he has this dream. And he comes and he gets all the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, uh, sorcerers, enchanters, all the different people that would give him advice, even on a spiritual level, um, in all the spiritual realm that Nebuchadnezzar knew. And uh, they would come and try to give him advice. And, and he, he told them, this is what you have to do. You have to tell me the dream and then interpret it. And then I'll know that that it's the right interpretation. Well, of course, they, they say, um, there's no way that we can tell you. Tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it means. And he said, no, you're just buying time. Um, you need to tell me what my dream was and interpret it. And uh, he becomes furious because obviously they're not able to. And 
uh, this, they said, well, nobody can do this. And the king became so angry that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So they come and they tell Daniel, because he's one of these wise men, he had not been called to the king yet, but uh, uh, he is told that he's going to be one of those that's killed. And starting in verse Daniel chapter 2, verse 13, it says, So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for more time so that he might interpret the dream for him. And then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God, of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power, and you've made known to me what, what, what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. <clears throat> Daniel goes to the king, and he says to the king, I, I can interpret this for you and tell you what the dream is. And Daniel says, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dreams and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. Then in verse 29 he says, As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mystery showed you what is going to happen. And as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive. So you see Daniel's humility it's not because I have greater wisdom, but so that your majesty may know the interpretations that you may understand what went through your mind. And so he tells, the, the, tells him the story of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has of this big statue with four different parts that are uh, talking about the different kingdoms that would rise up in the future and then ultimately the kingdom of God that would last forever. And he tells him the dream and then he tells him the interpretation. And in verse 46 it says that King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. And the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. And he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So here they are in, the, in a political realm, and uh, with every reason to hate the king that, that they work for, because of what he has done to their culture, their city, to their lives, to their families, to their faith. Yet here Daniel is still holding to his faith, and in that moment of crisis, in that moment of need, Daniel says, I have an answer. And he goes to the Lord, and he asks the Lord to reveal what this dream is and the interpretation, and God does, and he gives praise to the Lord who brings up kings and brings them down. And he praises the Lord for giving wisdom and power and says that wisdom does not come from us, it comes from God. That power comes from God. And when God's power and wisdom are poured out into situations, uh, we have answers. God moves uh, through his people in the earth to be his witness. And the king suddenly um, honors Daniel and sees that Daniel's God is the, the God of wisdom, the God of power. Uh, what a powerful story uh, that is. And we have uh, Daniel in chapter 6. Uh, um, 
1 through 5. I just want to bring these two stories together and then kind of tie it together. It won't be too long. Daniel 6, 1 through 5, the King Darius is now king, and it says that it pleased Darius to appoint. So Daniel's living for the Lord in the, the court, the king's court, and he sees kings come and he sees kings go. He lives through um, multiple kings in his lifetime there in Babylon and ultimately Persia as well. It, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And so these officials that are trying to take down Daniel go to the king and they try to set the king up and they try to set Daniel up. And they say, uh, they know that Daniel prays and he opens his windows and he looks toward Jerusalem and prays three times a day. And um, so they, they go to the king and they say, let the uh, king make a decree that whoever prays to any god or any human besides you, O king, that they would be put to death. Well, Daniel knows of this, but Daniel's relationship with God is first priority. Uh, he has this uh, uh, amazing relationship with King Darius, and Darius loves Daniel, which uh, shows Daniel's character in the midst of that uh, of a pagan culture, in the midst of of a kingdom that he should hate as his mortal enemy, yet he so distinguishes himself that uh, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He uh, conducted his affairs with, without corruption, without negligence, and he was trustworthy. And so da Daniel, uh, but Daniel prays because his relationship with God is first priority. He's, he won't compromise that. He won't compromise his convictions, even though he serves faithfully the king. Because of that, we have the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And, um, and, and Dan, so Daniel's in the lion's den, and the king is so disturbed because he loves Daniel and, and thinks so highly of Daniel that he cannot sleep all night. And he says, may your God save you. And at the end, Daniel, uh, the king comes back early in the morning and opens it up, and Daniel's still alive. And, and uh, then... He, they take Daniel out, and the king is so angry at those who tried to set set him up uh, uh, to kill him that they throw the king throws those people into the lion's den. And as soon as before they even hit the ground, the lions uh, eat them and kill them. And the king issues a decree in verse twenty six of chapter six. It says that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, and he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. And so Daniel prospers through all of these kings and, and flourishes through a lifestyle that I just want to talk about for a few minutes because I think that the credibility of the church, the witness of the church is really at a, at a crossroads right now. Um, there are the wise men of the day, whether it's our college professors or the media or, or different people in different fields that we consider the wise men of the day. But just because we consider them the wise men of the day, some of them may be, and they may have a certain amount of, of, of uh, intelligence and expertise, but if they don't honor God, we know that ultimately wisdom comes from God, and because of, of the lack of, of an honoring of God, there's going to be a lack of wisdom, even among those uh, who are supposed experts in certain fields. We look to God for wisdom and for power. And wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit are crucial qualities in the time in which we live. They're crucial right now. If the church doesn't have wisdom, if we don't have answers uh, in this, this time, then the world's going to go searching everywhere else. 
And if we don't have the power of God in our lives to do miracles, to do the 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 supernatural, to work in our through us and in us like God did in Daniel, then we won't have the influence that that we want. So we need a wisdom. A wisdom is skill for living in godly way. It's skill for living. It's to know the truth in our hearts and our minds, but then to know how to apply it to life. And so it's to know the truth, to know it deeply in our hearts and our minds, but then wisdom can take that truth and know that truth and apply it to life in a practical way. But wisdom and, and the power of the Holy Spirit come not through anything that we can earn. It's the grace of God, but it comes in it's fostered in a lifestyle and Daniel lives this lifestyle that we see in the way that he navigates life in Babylon in a pagan culture with the people that he should hate not driven by a political spirit but driven by his love for God living driven by his love for God and out of that love for God there's something in him that can even love his enemy that can even honor his enemy and we see that uh, in the way that he talks to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, this is not, this. Uh, I can interpret your dream not because of wisdom, my own wisdom, but because it's the wisdom of God and it's come so your majesty can know what is happening. So he honors this code of honor in the heart of Daniel that in, in this crisis, when he's interpreting the dream, he's not looking to lift up himself. This is not my own wisdom. This has come from God, and it's because God wants to reveal to you, O oh king, what is about to happen and what's coming in, in the coming ages. It's, it's honoring the king and saying, this is for you, your majesty. This, this lifestyle of service, this lifestyle of humility, this lifestyle of honor that even honors his mortal enemy. And in that moment, as Jesus taught us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, that that was... The way that the, the thing that Jesus taught, and that Daniel in this Old Testament story uh, navigates life in that way, and he spoke with wisdom and with tact to those around him. With wisdom, he had answers from heaven, wisdom from heaven. Uh, and God has called us as the church to have answers, to have wisdom from heaven. But that wisdom com was communicated by Daniel with tact and with honor. And we see in Daniel integrity. He did what was right. He said that he, well, there was no corruption and no negligence in him, that he was trustworthy. He did what was right. He made good choices, and then he did it with excellence. We see in Daniel an aptitude, a skill, and an excellence in what he does. In fact, excellence and skill are part of, of wisdom. In Exodus 31, 1 through 7, Moses um, chooses people to build the tabernacle. And it says, I have chosen these people, and I have, uh, God says, uh, I have chosen these people, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, and with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills skills to make artistic designs for work in gold silver and bronze to cut and set stones to make in to, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of crafts and so he talks about skill in terms of being wisdom that wisdom is is the ability to take the truth and to apply it to life in a practical way but it, it's it broadly even uh, goes into our uh, the different things that we do practically in life, that there's an excellence about what we do, what we're called to do, or what we do in life, that we do it with such a skill and such an excellence and such an integrity and such a character and a trustworthiness with no corruption and no negligence in us, and then with a, a, a code of honor in our hearts and a love for other people that can even honor our enemies and even love our enemies, and love those that we disagree with. And that in, that in that lifestyle, God gave Daniel the power of God's Spirit, the supernatural moments in which God gave Daniel wisdom from heaven. And because of that wisdom, revival came to a whole nation. And that's the power of God that the Holy Spirit can do in a moment. Jesus can do in a moment through, through one answer of wisdom and one move of God's hand of power that God can do in a moment what a political spirit could never do in decades trying to, to work our way into power. 
that one answer of wisdom, standing in the gates of politics, standing in the gates of culture, being involved wherever we're at, that, that Daniel's integrity and his honor um, his and his skill and his excellence set him apart from other people. And the king noticed. And in those moments when the king needed something or in those moments of crisis or in those moments when Daniel had to make a stand, God had his back. And God used him, and because of that, the whole nation had to acknowledge, a whole pagan nation had to suddenly acknowledge the God of Daniel. God tells us to get wisdom, though it costs all that we have. Proverbs 1, seven says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and I think that's one of the tools that we need is not just an integrity uh, of heart, not just a code of honor that will honor people um, and walk with honor in how we relate to one another, even our enemies, even those we disagree with, even those on the other side politically, that we walk with a code of honor in the way that we treat people and the way that we talk to people. That Daniel sat, uh, stood before the king and said, his mortal enemy and said this is for you your majesty that the lord has interpreted this dream but the fear of the lord is the beginning of that and the fear of the lord is this awe and the reverence of god but it's also even it, it means to be afraid it's not to be afraid not that we're supposed to live being afraid of god i think the fear of the lord gets us to this place where we're afraid not to be with god that that's really what the fear of the lord is is it's to be afraid not to be with god and to be with God, we know that his perfect love casts out all fear. And we don't have to be afraid because we have relationship with him. But there's an awe in the fear of the Lord, an awe and a reverence for God that causes us to, to, to be mortally afraid of walking away from God, of not walking in his ways. But that knowing that in him, that with him, that he says, I've not given you a spirit of fear. Fear has to do with punishment. I've given you a spirit of love. I've love, perfect love casts out all fear, and I've you've I've given you a spirit of sonship where you can call me Abba, Father. You can call me Daddy. Psalm eighty six eleven says, "Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name." So we lead a life that leads to wisdom with the fear of the Lord. We live lead a life that leads to wisdom that fosters wisdom from heaven. By living in the fear of the Lord, not afraid of the Lord, but afraid of not being with him. Like this healthy fear, this awe and reverence for the Lord that says, I dare not walk away from you. I dare not turn my back on you. I need to know your ways and to know that in him, that with him, that we have no reason to be afraid. Because he's cast out all fear by his love. That he took the punishment that we deserved on the cross and so we need not fear punishment when we're when we put our faith in Jesus and walk with Him. So if we walk in the fear of the Lord, this healthy fear of the Lord, and with honor and with excellence and skill and with integrity. And so we lead a life that fosters it. And then there are a few things that I just want to close with that kind of help us navigate. If we if we need as the church to have answers in the different gates of culture that we stand in. That it's not our job to 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 live with this politically political spirit fueling an argument. That it's our job to stand in the culture and to have real answers from heaven that give people hope and that give people uh, real uh, answers for life. And James and we need that for ourselves, for our families, for our businesses, for our ministries, for uh, navigating COVID, for navigating. Um, a, a divided, a time where we're so divided for navigating uh, the situations that we're facing in our lives and in our families. We need God's wisdom as well as answers for the world around us. In James 1, 5 through 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything for the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And so like Daniel, who had this kind of 
set his heart on the Lord. He wasn't double-minded. He had set his heart on the Lord, and he was going to stand for the Lord no matter what. And he asked for wisdom to interpret the king's dream. And here James tells us, ask for wisdom. If you lack wisdom in an area, or if you lack wisdom in life, ask him who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So believe and ask. Another way we grow in wisdom is the company we keep. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety that there is safety in a multitude of counselors, that there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. And so um, finding good people, it's not just going to our peer um, unless our peer is really a person of wisdom, a person of honor and integrity. It's finding those people who have flourished in life and who walk with the Lord, those people that we look up to and we say uh, they, they have answers and we find those people and we make them a part of our lives. We find a, a company of of people like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, kind of this code of honor of a group of, of knights that, that we find a group of people that we can do life with, with a code of honor in our hearts and that we grow in wisdom from one another. And then we seek wisdom Proverbs 4, 5 through 9 says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of this is, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Get understanding. So the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, but he also says here in verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. We see in 1 Chronicles 12, 23, that as God has rejected King Saul and anointed David as king, but there's this transition period where Saul is jealous of David and trying to kill him. And we see people beginning to follow David because they see the anointing of God on his life. And in 1 Chronicles 12, 23, it says, These numbers of men that were armed for battle came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him, as the Lord had said. And in verse 26, it, it points out people from one group in particular, from Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all of their relatives under their command. From Issachar, some men who joined David, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. That now's the time for the church to be those who understand the times, who have wisdom from heaven, and know what we should do. Proverbs 8, 1 through 5 says, Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? As though wisdom right now were standing in Washington, D.C. at some important point, uh, proclaiming over our whole nation, does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice at the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading, leading into the city at the entrance, she cries aloud, To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Set your hearts on wisdom to seek it. There's this hunger. There's this asking of the Lord for wisdom and there's this seeking in the company of other wise men and women and that there's this seeking through God's word and through even the wisdom of other other believers and and books and different and teachings and different things that where we're just we're seeking truth not for head knowledge but for transformation in our hearts and for wisdom to apply the truth to life in a way that the world would see our light and that they would be drawn to it, they would see that that we know how that we do business in the in the kingdom of God, and it works because God's ways work. That we do family the way God does fa tells us to do family in God's kingdom, and that it's a witness to the world because God's ways work. That God's ways in marriage work. That God's ways in, in navigating government work, and that Daniel was a witness for that. That even in a political realm that you can, can live not driven by a political spirit, but driven by a code of honor in your heart that could even look at your enemy in the eyes 
who had uprooted your family, had burned your temple to the ground, had attacked your faith, had burned your city to the ground and taken you into exile and you look him in the eye and you say, the Lord interpreted this dream for you, O majesty, and I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve you and I have answers. And it's in that code of honor that integrity and that wisdom and the excellence and skill that are all parts of living out a wise life that God gives us wisdom from heaven to, to navigate life, to navigate our business in a time where it's difficult to navigate business, to navigate life and faith and church and family and relationships. In a time where it's difficult, God has answers. And he says, ask, ask and I'll give it to you. So we as God's church want to come and ask. And so, Lord, I pray for all who've watched, Lord, as we come to you. I pray in Jesus' name that you would give us wisdom from heaven. Lord, we need uh, your answers for now. I pray, Lord, that just as in, in a moment of wisdom and power, you shifted a nation. Lord, in a moment, you can give your church, even in a key position somewhere, wisdom that, that shifts everything. You can give us wisdom and power that in a moment shifts our family. You can give us wisdom and power that in a moment shifts our business. You can give us wisdom and power in a moment that shifts our community or our nation. And so, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We ask you for the power of your spirit to work in that to work that wisdom in us and through us in a way that changes a nation that changes our community but lord that changes our family and us first we love you and we praise you today and i pray for everyone who's watched lord whatever needs they have i pray that you would meet them that you would heal the sick that you would um, provide supernaturally those who have needs lord and that you would work in broken relationships and heal broken hearts I pray blessing on everyone that's watched, Lord, and that's uh, as we've uh, gotten into your word together. And we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you have a great week. God bless you.